Good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to take you through what's been a very productive year in interventional cardiology based on a lot of work from a large number of people and then I'm going to take you through some of the kind of exciting things that are on the immediate horizon within the group. So at the moment we've got 28 active research projects, a mixture of eligible adopted and non-eligible adopted and commercial studies. And so these studies range everything from <coughs> institutional based studies through national studies to large international studies. We've got 14 studies currently recruiting um, and we've got further 14 currently in follow-up. The all eight consultants that are based at the Jubilee and Interventional Cardiology are currently principal investigators on trials. So this is a broad church of people involved in this work. We've currently got two chief investigators of multi-centre randomised uh, control trials. Um, Professor Oldroyd is currently the NRS National Champion for Cardiovascular Disease. And Professor Benny is currently the chair of the NRS West Node for Cardiovascular Imaging Group. But we've got five research nurses who very robustly support all the work that's going on. As you can see, there's a lot of work. And all by the nature of the type of studies we do, all the research is very actively supported by the nurses and allied health professionals in the cath labs and on rewards on a daily basis, on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you look at our productivity from 2011 to 2016, we've had a three-fold rise in our publications. Quite dramatic, really from 14 up to 43 publications over the last three, over the last 12 months. So all these 43 publications over the last 12 months, 11 of those have been in the top five impact factor journals in cardiology, um, as listed here. So what I'm going to do is just show you a few of those highlights um, from the last uh, 12 months. So this time last year, um, Leaders 3 study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And Keith Oldroy was the, the principal investigator for us in this trial. So what was this study looking at? So up until recent times, we had two types of stents for coronary arteries. There was a bare metal stent and there was a drug looting stent. The idea of drug looting stents was to try and prevent re-narrowing the stents once you put them in the coronary arteries. And that's been a very, um, very successful therapeutic change in the device technology. How the drug is bound to the stent is it's bound with a polymer. And it usually takes about roughly six months for the drug to dissolve off the stent, but leaving the polymer behind. And there'd become some concern that the residual polymer in the stent was pro-inflammatory and possibly pro-thrombotic. So the, the technology has further evolved. In recent times, there was developed a drug-coated stent where the drug essentially is embedded on the stent but without the polymer. When you get a drug looting stent, the current standard of care um, in the west of Scotland is you get six months of dual antibiotic therapy. So you get aspirin and usually clopidogrel or ticagrelor as a second agent. And that's so that you, you have two antibiotic agents in your blood to stop clots sticking to the stent until a lining goes over the stent and becomes part of the vessel structure. With a bare metal stent, you only traditionally would get one month of dual antibiotic therapy because of the lack of the drug and lack of polymer. And the idea of the drug coated stent would be you'd be able to do the same. So you can see how this would be attractive for patients that have got bleeding problems or needing surgery. If we can get a stent that performs like a drug looting stent, but without the problem with shorter antibiotic duration. So this study was looking at a patient population where you wanted them to have short duration of blood thinning for various reasons and comparing an old-fashioned bare metal stent to this new stent. And essentially what the study showed was the new stent reduced your instance of death, MI or stent thrombosis um, and, and your need for further intervention on the coronary artery because of renarrowing of the stent. So it was both safe and effective. So this is a big impact study and has um, directly influenced um, patient care. So the big, the most anticipated uh, research study <coughs> worldwide in interventional cardiology this year was the NOBLE trial and simultaneous study called the XL trial. So these were two studies. NOBLE ran mainly in the UK and North Europe and XL ran mainly in the USA with some European sites as well. And this, this trials ran parallel and both were presented and published simultaneously at TCT in Washington last month, which is the biggest interventional meeting in the world. The Jubilee Interventional Group were enormously influential in the NOVO study. One of the top recruiting sites also involved in the, um, the design, setup, and management of this study. You'll see on the author list there that both Mitchell Lindsay and Keith Oldroyd were authored in the, in the seminal paper in The Lancet. So what was this study looking at? So what you see here is the left coronary arteries. 
So the first, um, the first strip you see is the left main stem, and you'll see it then divides into three branches in the left system. You'll see there's a critical narrowing where that green ar arrow is, and that's, that's distal left main stem disease. So you can potentially see what the, the technical problems are of trying to fix that lesion in terms of preserving all three branches that are supplying the myocardium. So traditionally, this type of disease was always managed with bypass surgery, where you would take grafts um, from the aorta and from the subclavian and essentially pump, plumb them on <coughs> this narrowing onto all the big major branches in the artery. But over recent years, with the evolution of technology and skill, we can now fix this with stents through a variety of methods. But the question is, can we do the stents and get the same outcome that you would get with the bypass operation? So both Noble and Excel were set up to answer this question. We can technically do it, but is it as effective? So this is basically what the outcome of the study was. So essentially, at five years, whether you get stents or bypass, there's no difference in mortality between the bypass group and the stents. What we do see um, is there's an increase in your need to come back to have further work done if you have stent and rather than bypass surgery. But you're talking about a difference of about a chance of 1 in 10 to a chance of 1 in 8 of coming back in 5 years to need something <coughs> done. So when you put it in that sort of context, although there is a difference of, on a day-to-day -day, um, level, the, the difference is not huge. And also, when you follow the patients up, if you get PCI, you've got a slightly higher risk of having a further myocardial infarction over the next five years. And that kind of makes sense to some degree if you think about it. If you plumb a whole new set of arteries past the narrowing, you're essentially re-plumbing the whole coronary system. You're not just fixing one spot in the artery. So any other wee plaques in the heart are getting a double blood supply as opposed to, uh, as opposed to becoming a problem in the future. So this is a hugely impactful study, the most talked about trial in interventional cardiology this year, and we were thankfully um, involved in this. Coming a wee bit closer to home, these are two big international studies that we played a key role in. This is one of the in-house studies that we published this year. We've um, developed in recent years a big reputation in doing research in acutely unwell patients. So you can imagine if you come in with a heart attack in the middle of the night, that's a very difficult situation in which to put patients into research studies. But at the Jubilee, we've developed a process um, by which we've managed to do this very effectively. We've done a lot of studies and published a lot in this over the last uh, few years. One of the things we've been interested in is the picture on the right you see is a patient who's come in with an anterior myocardial infarction. And what you're seeing is the left coronary system. And you'll see that the dye fills the artery and then it suddenly bluntly is cut off and that's a clot occluding the coronary artery and that's what happens, what happens when you have a heart attack. And what you see on the right hand side is there's a wire through that, it's been stretched all open and it's been fixed and you can see the whole coronary tree that was missing before. So this is what's called primary PCI, primary percutaneous coronary intervention. It's a highly effective treatment but what we notice we're the highest volume primary PCI centre in the UK, or the second highest volume centre in the UK. So we have a huge experience of this in a day-to-day, night-by-night, 24-7 um, experience. So what we noticed was, although most patients do very well with this, there's a subsection of patients who don't do so well. We wanted to explore what it is about those patients uh, during the procedure that results in them not doing so well. And what we wondered about was whether it's to do with, although the artery is open, the downstream behaviour of the coronary circulation that we don't see down to the muscle level. So, sorry. So what you can do is there's a specialised wire which at the tip, close to the tip, it has a transducer. And with that transducer you can measure pressure and you can measure flow and you can measure resistance in the, the distal coronary bed. So we wondered about whether the patients that don't do so well have a problem with the resistance in their, their distal coronary bed. So what we did was in a, in a, in a large cohort of patients, we came in with STEMI, once we'd fixed the artery, we measured their resistance, this is ILR, and we measured their flows. And what we were able to show, if you look at panel D, is if you have very high resistance, an IMR of 92 versus an IMR of 12, and when you MRI these patients after their infarct, they, these are the patients that have a huge amount of damage to the heart. So basically what we've determined is there's something we can measure at the time of you coming in with your heart attack that will predict how you're going to do after your heart attack. So then that becomes a potentially therapeutic target for us. So if we can modify that at the time of your procedure, we can improve your outcome. Okay, so looking at what's on the horizon, so 
We've just completed this study, the ideal life means study. So this is a, a, an international um, multi-center RCT that Keith Oldroyd is the chief investigator on. It's an investigative <coughs> study funded by Boston Scientific. Julie is a sponsor and the CRO is very life science. Um, so this was patients coming back to Novo. This was patients who had left main stem disease like you saw, but the decision of the MDT has been they should have PCI. So the, the decision by the group is PCI rather than bypass. 819 patients across 17, seven European countries. And as I say, it's just completed recruitment in September and will be followed up over the next um, three years. So in the study, the primary outcome is death, MI, or ischemia-driven revascularization of your coronary arteries. Um, so we'll see over the next um, two years. And really the aim of this study was to compare two different types of uh, stents. So coming back to our, our discussion about drug-coated stents, at the same time, Boston Scientific have developed a stent called the Synergy stent. And this stent, what it does is it's got a polymer and it's got a drug, but when the drug goes, the polymer goes. So the polymer doesn't stay, it goes as well, so you're left with a bare metal stent. So these two philosophies, one where you embed the drug in the stent without polymer, or you attach the drug with the polymer, but the polymer disappears as well. And it's comparing a normal drug looking stent, the designs on the right, to this synergy stent with a shorter duration of blood pounding. So, so we'll see how, how this evolves. The other big exciting thing that's going on in the group at the moment is the tea time study. So this is a UK multi-centred randomised controlled trial with Colin Berry as the chief investigator and Hany Atiba as the principal investigator. So coming back to our discussion about the microvascular circulation, so this is this angiogram of the patient who's had their artery opened after their, their heart attack. The picture on the right is a very famous picture in the world of interventional cardiology that shows this is what we see on x-ray on the left hand side. This is actually the, the microcirculation of the heart. So you can see we're only seeing part of the big picture. So what we thought was these patients after heart attacks where their resistance in their small arteries is high, if we gave them a small dose of fibrinolysis, a drug that dissolves tiny clots into the distal bed, can we improve their outcomes? So this is what tea time is looking at. So it's basically at the time of opening the artery, you then deliver distal into the artery, small doses of fibrinolysis, and then we'll see if this improves outcomes in patients. So you randomise to a dose of the fibrinolytic or to a placebo, and then the patients will all be, be followed up. One of the really exciting things I think about this study is that it's the first big multi-centre RCT that we've devised, set up, designed, and are running as a group. So we've, this is a kind of first trial out of a new structure within the group. So Colin's chief investigator, Hani's principal investigator. And then because we are going to be receiving all the data from all over the UK, which is going to be a huge amount of data, including angiograms, ECGs, uh, MRI data, plus all the clinical data, we've got sub PIs to look after all that. Um, and we're, it's our first <coughs> chance of running what you call a core lab. So a core lab is essentially a centre that becomes regarded as an, a, 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 an excellent data analysis centre. So we want to establish a coronary core lab where we become a go-to centre for people to send us their angiograms to analyse them in trials. We already have an established ECG core lab in Glasgow and we're also trying to set up again a CMR type core lab. And this study has been um, very actively run by one of our very promising research girls and um, research nurses dedicated to this trial. So this is an exciting opportunity for us as a group to become an established centre for running large randomised uh, trials. Okay, just I'm going to mention two, two or three more small things. This is a project we've just completed. It's about a baby of mine. So essentially the picture on the right shows a coronary artery you can see is horribly diseased. I don't know if you can appreciate it, but before the dye is in, the vessel almost looks kind of black. You can almost see the artery before the dye is injected. That's calcium. So on the right hand side is what you call a rotablator, which is a device that's diamond encrusted and you drive it up and down the artery to sand the artery out. So this was a, you'd imagine therefore if you sand off the plaque in the artery, you'd imagine that plaque will disseminate downstream and much like with a heart attack of clot, that that plaque might cause obstruction downstream. Now this is a device we're having to use more and more and more because as we all get older and people are living longer, the arteries are getting more calcified. So we thought it was really important to determine whether when we do this, we cause injury to the heart or not. So we've just completed a cohort, cohort of patients where we've measured the resistance with the wire, like we described already, 
patients have all had blood tests to see if there's any evidence of infarction and the patients have all had MRIs and or the manuscripts have been processed and hopefully will be finished by the end <coughs> so that's been interesting and that's just some of the images. We've also just completed the basal and FFR study led by Keith Oldroyd. We know that if you have a narrowing in your artery and it's 90 or 95 percent you should fix that, that narrowing but if you have a narrowing in your artery and it's 30 80 percent we don't know whether you just looking at it you don't know whether you can you should fix it so in those situations where the artery is not critically narrowed but moderately narrowed what we do is we pass this wire across the artery and we can measure pressure proximal to the narrowing and pressure distal to the narrowing and if that pressure drops off to less than 75 percent you should fix that narrowing and that's all been proven in previous research trials that we've been involved in with um, other groups around europe in the past once the pressure gets over 80%, once the is more than 80%, you should definitely leave it. But there's this bit in the middle between 75 and 80% where we're not sure. And those endpoints have been used in studies. Some studies use 75%, some use 80%. So there's this bit in the middle called grey zone. So we've just done a study where we've taken patients who have pressures in the grey zone and they've been randomised to treatment or no treatment. And that study's just finished and it's just in follow-up at the moment. So that's going to be a really interesting and important outcome um, once that's... We know the needs from that. The, um, one other thing that's currently started and is uh, evolving is around the area of patients who have angina, but when you do the angiogram, the arteries aren't narrowed. So this is a program that Paul and Barry has um, instigated and is establishing. So you have a patient who comes to the clinic and they've got symptoms of angina. You bring them for an angiogram and the arteries, the big arteries we see look okay. But the story is quite convincing. So we think, and other groups think, there's another process going on here. And again, it has to do with the small vessels that we don't see and we can't measure. And also to do with the way the arteries respond, so the reactivity of the arteries. So this programme is essentially three big studies which are going to look at this problem from various angles, try and define what this problem is, and then look at potential therapeutic options. Okay, lastly, um, in terms of what, what is uh, on the horizon for next year, UK TAVI study. So as I'm sure most of you know, we, we don't do TAVI at the moment, but hopefully will be shortly. So TAVI is when, if you have a narrowed aortic valve, conventionally you would have that repair with open heart surgery, so you'd open the chest and replace the valve. But with TAVI, what you do is you put a new valve in with a catheter up through the leg, and the valve goes through the aortic <coughs> valve, and essentially it's just a huge stent, it's like 10 times the size of the stent. You inflate a balloon and deploy the new valve inside the old valve. It's become a well established therapy worldwide, and there's been lots of data and trials to prove its effectiveness. UK TAVI trial is taking a cohort of patients with intermediate risk for valve surgery and randomising them to a surgical valve versus a transcatheter valve. Now, although we are not doing TAVI at the moment, we've just been activated or just in the process of being activated as a surgical site for the studies. So we're going to get involved in the trial, randomise patients, and if they get randomised the surgery, the surgery will be done here until we're doing TAVI. So that's good, we're getting ourselves involved, we've been desperate to get involved in this research field. The other thing in the horizon is the mitral clip study. So if you have a leaking <coughs> mitral valve in your heart, conventionally you had to have open heart surgery to repair it. There's now a device that's been available for a while which essentially is a clip. You've got the right heart through the septum, down through the valve, and you essentially clip the leaflets together to try and reduce the amount of regurgitation. And I know that um, Professor Oldroy and Professor Petri are currently involved in designing and setting up a, a magic clip study, so that's hopefully something which is also um, coming. <coughs> so in terms of actually the strategy for the group going forward, I think having started um, to run international multicentric trials with Professor and Professor Berry, this is something that we can now move forward and build on. Um, there is one of the current very topical areas in interventional cardiology has been able to do usual care studies. So when you run a trial and patients come in, they have to fit inclusion and exclusion criteria. And by the nature of that, you look at a specific patient group. But the idea is that it would be much more helpful if everybody that comes in the door with a particular condition goes into a study, because then the data is applicable to everybody, not just a subset of the patients. There's been a lot of work done in this in Sweden, where they have the infrastructure set up that essentially 
they have all these huge databases that allows us to happen and have randomization at the point of admission into various studies. So we're very interested in exploring this. And one of the beauties of this is that by using electronic data, data linkage, which we have in Scotland, very fortuitously, these types of studies can be done very economically with huge volumes of patients, thousands and tens of thousands of patients. As I mentioned, we want to try and get further involved in the trans catheter valve therapy studies as we become an established centre for that. And I think lastly, we should start thinking and working on the role of the allied health professionals in our research portfolio. There's a huge amount of research going on in the group and I think we need to now that all the clinicians are involved, we need to start rolling that out through the other groups in the department. So looking at our trajectory, if we keep on the same incremental rise in the work we're doing, by 2020 we're looking at 70 publications a year within the group, which is obviously huge, a very exciting prospect. Thank you very much.